thanks, uh, thanks to all of you for coming. And I want to thank uh, Roland, all the, the Red Jersey, for uh, having this meeting, which is uh, pretty neat. <clears throat> then, uh, I'm like, a, like I was introduced, I'm JF Terry. I'm from uh, Eastern Canada. I'm, I'm a French Canadian, so I have a French name. So I go with, just with the initial, so it's easier for that. I now work in the US in, at, at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Pennsylvania, where we do research on birds of prey. And uh, well, the title is, is, is what I've been doing with that. Uh, modeling thing and here we're in the tutorial so we're going to talk about uh, state space modeling and and something that was developed not by me but that we use to uh, assess movement of snowy owls so we'll go through that and I'll talk about snowy owl first and then the, the modeling aspect <clears throat> and then um, well I should uh, apologize maybe because I don't have fancy equations I don't have uh, I, I, I have a few nice pics though like this one but other than that, I mean, it, it will be, uh, we'll talk about biology, uh, first of all, and then the, the modeling aspect. <clears throat> Some, so the, the state-space modeling we've, we have been using have been developed not by me, by uh, folks from Atlantic Canada, Ian Johnson and Fran. So I don't want to take credit for all of that. I just, I'm just using the tool, making it available for you guys. So Roland asked me if we had anything to, uh, that we want to share, and that's a pleasure to me to share what we've been doing, and thanks for uh, having this opportunity. And then if you have any question or any comment or, or complaint, if you like what we've been doing, well, uh, I'm, I'm glad about that. And, and we need to thank those guys from Atlantic Canada. If you have complaint and you think this is not good, well, again, I'm, I'm, yeah, no, I'll take some responsibility for it. <clears throat> so um, what we've been doing so far, we've been studying snowy owl for uh, several years. And one of the things about snowy owl is that, um, well, you, you'll see that coming later, but they're, they're called eruptive migrants. So they move a lot from one year to another, and we try to uh, decipher that. So to look at snowy owl, well, first the breeding range is uh, pretty vast over North America. It goes all the way to Russia, Fennel Scandinavia, and, uh, <clears throat> and all the circum circumpolar world. And here in, in North America, this is what it looks like. So it's pretty huge habitat where well, you could find those guys. So this is a typical habitat for, from where we work. So it's a mix of flatland and uh, hilly terrain. And one of the main things about Arctic tundra is those guys. Those are the main herbivores, the lemmings. They uh, occur throughout most of the uh, circumpolar world. And one particula particular thing about those guys, I mean, they're, they're the size of a, of, a, of a mouse, apparently, uh, similar to a mouse. And what they do is they, they show cyclic variation in abundance. So one year you have plenty. And then next year, you got very few or none in between those years. So you have those cycles. <clears throat> a lot of, of lemmings in one year, and then in the next year, you have very few. If you, we mirror the number of snowy owls' nests on our study site over the lemming abundance, well, you, you see, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, a strong pattern. There's a strong relationship between lemmings and owls. We know owls eat a lot of lemmings. And then when lemmings are at high abundance, well, you got a lot of snowy owls as well. So that was the first thing that we saw through the long-term study that we had at our, at, our, at our study site. The thing that we want to, the, the main question was that in between those years when the snowy owls are not breeding on the island, well, where are they? Where, where do they go? Because they're not on the study area. And then to do that, we uh, needed to do the telemetry thing. And then we use the modeling to assess uh, the, the pattern, the daily patterns. So here's where I'm working, mostly the study area. HMS is Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, where I work from. We work in the Arctic at Bylot Island, so it's a, it's a neat, neat place to go. I got, I think, a few pictures just to show um, what it looks like, like a mix of wetland and drier habitat. You see that base camp, so it's a nice playground. <coughs> we'll, uh, I mean, we're camping out there, so it's still fun. I like it. This is a typical snowy owl's nest overlooking that valley, and uh, we, uh, typical chicks in the nest, typical biologists waiting those, those chicks, and then the male looking for me, and then they get, they get bigger, and then we tr we're tracking that every year. We're, we're assessing how many owls there are, uh, how many chicks they produce, and uh, how quick they grow. <clears throat> and we use a bunch of other things to assess uh, behavior, like those camera traps that you can assess how many lemmings are brought back to the nest every, every day or so on. But the main thing we do is to do the tracking thing. So we use those uh, satellite telemetry unit. We did that, we started that project in 2007. We were using Argos uh, satellite 
to, uh, to do that, mainly because of a few reasons. But the thing is, in the Arctic, well, there's no cell phone coverage. So the GSM units that are now available, they're, uh, they're, they will be, an, uh, uh, I mean, of no help in the Arctic. The other thing is that those guys can spend a lot of time in the Arctic, even in the wintertime when it's, it's, there's no sunlight or it's, it might be 24-hour darkness. So we don't uh, rely on solar power to uh, recharge those, those batteries. So we need a, a, a closed case and, and <clears throat> that kind of uh, units that we put on the bird. And then we release the bird. We trap the bird with a bow net. People are asking me, how do you trap the bird? But I'll go quickly because you're kind of familiar with that. So here's the kind of pattern we see from a, a typical year, I'd say, for, for 12 birds that we track from Bile Island. So Bile Island is over here, and they all left this island as the autumn was coming in. And then some bird went to southern latitudes. This is Newfoundland. This is North Dakota, or, or in here, and then South Dakota. And then they moved back to breeding range in the, next, in the next summer. Some of them spend the whole winter at high latitude, even going towards the North Pole. And so <clears throat> they're typically, I mean, they're, they're just the opposite of what we used to see in any migratory bird. Most of the birds go from point A, migrate to a wintering site, point B, and do the back and forth thing, mostly in a straight line, trying to uh, bring that migration timing, the, the time they're, they're spending in migration, to a minimum, because they're, they're highly vulnerable for um, <clears throat> I mean, losing energy, being attacked by predators, and so on. So most of the bird will go from point A to point B, pretty straight line. But those, those owls, they, they just do the opposite. They're, they're moving and zigzagging and, and spending a lot of time throughout migra migration until they finally settle back in, in the summertime. <clears throat> so we were trying to assess uh, the movement pattern, the, the, the prospecting period in, in the, the spring, because one thing we saw is that after four years of tracking, none of those birds came back to Bilal Island where we marked them. They, they, they were not faithful to a breeding area. They, they move and bred a very high distance from, from the point of origin. And an average distance of breeding dispersal is 700 kilometers every year. So this, I was looking at breeding dispersal in theory. And I mean, the graphs were stopping at like 50 kilometers. Uh, we had some report of, of other eruptive bird that could go that kind of distance, but none of them were confirmed breeders every year. And those ones were. We went on the ground and confirmed they were breeding. So one thing we, uh, we saw, we were able to trap lemmings at the sites where they settled. And we, uh, we um, understood that, well, they're, they're tracking lemmings. Lemmings, like I said, are showing a, a lot of variation from one year to another at a given site. And then one year you got none at one site, and, but you have an eruption at another site. And then those are are tracking them. And th this is what we, th we think they were doing. In the springtime, they, they're zigzagging, looking for a place where lemmings are uh, in high abundance. And then they settle and breed. So you see those guys from Bilal Island went out, breed in Greenland, some other in Western Canada, Northern Quebec. So they're highly mobile. They, breed, they, they have that breeding dispersal, which is pretty uh, fascinating. <clears throat> then the thing is, when we uh, look at that, uh, the database, uh, the Argos transmission, well, some, I mean, most of you that work with birds or tracking with Argos, you're familiar with that. But you do have a set of location at irregular intervals. So we, what we did have in that, that case was a set of location around 10 or 12 location every other day or every third day because you don't want to drain the whole battery from the, the transmission, the transmitter. And then you, want, you try to cover the whole, the, the whole year. And then we had that kind of... Uh, set up with a bunch of location close in time and then a gap with no, no locations. And then all of those locations that we had were associated with a quality or a precision uh, index. So uh, starting from the highest precision to the lowest precision. So it's, um, we wanted to try to work with that, trying not to remove all the, the, the location of lower uh, quality, but trying to have the, the best data set possible. Like I said, uh, we tried to have the, those batteries working for uh, several years. So we didn't have a location every 30 minutes like it's possible now. We have a set of location every other day or every, every third day. So it was not, we, didn't, we didn't have the best resolution, temporal resolution, to assess that. But we, and that's why we use uh, the SSM models. So we use that, the, those models, like I said, developed by Johnson. It dates back from 2005, so some of you might be 
familiar with that, but we didn't see much of that, uh, those, those models in the literature. So <clears throat> that's why I, try, I, I decided to present that because uh, it, it worked pretty well for us. If any one of you would like to do that, I, I have the scripts. I could, I could pass the two uh, USB drives if you want to install that on your computers or did we, did we do that? Anyway, so you could just pass that along. <clears throat> and then if you have any question, if it doesn't work while we're doing it, because I tried this morning doing the, the same thing as the, the tutorial and it's kind of hard to follow, but anyway, you can just come and see me afterwards and we'll, we'll make it happen. So uh, following those two papers by Johnson and Friend, we uh, implemented that with our snow, snowy owl tracking that we had. And uh, so basically, the Bayesian approach to um, estimate location based on previous and forthcoming location, estimates the most probable location, a fixed time step. That was very helpful for us, giving the, the Argos uh, location that we had. And all those estimates uh, take, into, uh, it take into account the precision of each location. So if it's based on high quality location, well, they give more strength to that, that estimate. So using those things, <clears throat> we were able to uh, assess the movement on a daily basis. One good thing about that uh, modeling approach, approach it was that it provided a behavioral state for each estimated location. In our case, this is a value, so from 1 to 2. So if the, the value is closer to 1, meaning the bird is um, <clears throat> having a high speed and low turning angle, which means it might be moving through the, 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 the habitat. And, and, and the opposite, it was a, a low speed and high turning angle. It means that the bird was searching or was feeding or, or, or staying in a, a given location. So we were able to assess that, having a behavioral state saying the bird is just moving in or is uh, actu actively searching for, um, for something. In this case, lemming, well, a, a, a place to breed. <clears throat> so we use, um, You'll see that in, in the coming slides with R, what we do. But a Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler, we use chains that, that, that we just um, estimate a bunch of locations. Those, those, those estimations were, were made of a bunch of locations that we discard some of them. We thin that to remove autocorrelation. And then we uh, kept the, the, the remaining 3,000 estimated location to uh, do the, the average. So it, uh, what it gives, Again, if I'm going back to that slide, the, this is the raw data, data that we had over a full year. And then we were interested in knowing what was happening in the pre-breeding movement from the departure to the uh, of the wintering area to the settlement on breeding ground. And we want to separate be between directional and prospection movement. So as you see, some of them are, uh, when they leave the, the wintering area, they're entering into some sort of uh, directional movement, they, they, they want to go back to bre a potential breeding ground and they're not searching right away. But after a while they switch and they have some searching and then they resume the, the moving and then go back to searching. So we were trying to assess <clears throat> the different, the time span in searching versus uh, moving and the duration of, of those movement and uh, the distance separating those searching area. So if the bird have, have been searching in, in highly spaced location, well it meant that the, the owls were looking at a broad scale to, to search for lemming. So that, that was we, we were interested in knowing. Of course this is basic biology for snowy owl. Now we want to refine that using envir envir environmental data to put that in front of the, the map saying well what could affect the decision of the, that single individual on a single spot at a single time. But for the first thing we just want to know where do they go what is the distance travel and how, how far apart are the search areas. So with the modeling we'll be doing right after I'm, I'm done with those maps, it's just to show you what we got. So basically those guys started from wintering ground into directional movement and, until they reach potential breeding ground. And then they start searching and then they move around and, and start searching again and then go back to moving and then search again until they settle. <clears throat> and we have those kind of pattern. Here's for uh, the next year. And again, I mean, if you, I mean, I don't know if it's clear, but that snowy owl that finally ended up here was starting from here, and then went all the way here. So it's it, they're not doing the, the the straight point E to point B kind of migration. They're they're zigzagging a lot. They're looking for something. And again, in 2010, 
So <coughs> what we saw is that they show extreme individual variability in orientation, distance, and duration. They show the longest breeding dispersal ever reported. And uh, they were, I mean, the movement were um, coherent with the, the prospection for lemming hypothesis. They show no fidelity to any breeding sites, and they settled in an area where lemming abundance was high. And one last thing, well, they, they bred in each year. So <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, on a biological or ecological point of view, we know those predators had a strong impact on the tundra ecosystem because they eat a lot of herbivores, a lot of lemmings, which, which are the main herbivores. So what we saw measuring the, the number of nests in function of the number, in relation to the number of lemmings, we see that they show a strong relationship. And then how, um, how many lemmings were consumed per day per square kilometer by owl is pretty fascinating. So the, those avian predators can regulate or at least limit the lemming numbers in the summertime. So it was, we, we put that in, in perspective saying, well, by moving from one point to another each year, they kind of uh, dampen the the number of lemmings at each time there, there was an eruption or a peak in, in abundance. So if you have any question, if you're interested in, in our project, I'm working at Oak Mountain, can be reached there. And <clears throat> for the next step, we're gonna do just the, the R thing. The, we're gonna run the, the, the package in, in R, assessing state space modeling. So first thing to do is uh, to have those, those packages. It needs a, a bunch of packages. Most of you that work with uh, tracking uh, data as have those packages already installed on your computer. And if you're not, I, I can leave, I mean, a few minutes if you want to go out and, and it's, it, it takes about two minutes to download those packages. They're, they're very uh, easy. There's a, a one zip file in, the, in the, the USB drive that I gave that you can install using R through um, a local file, a zip, <coughs> a zip file. And then that, that one too. So, if you're, um, I'll go through the, um, the analysis, if you have, I can just stop here for any question about the biology and ecology, and then we'll run the, the analysis. Yeah. On the previous slide. Yeah. Not that one, right? No. Right. <laughs> okay. On the right, what are the, are the two lemmings? There's two lemming species. I, I forgot, I forgot to tell. Okay. I, I'm sorry. So both lemming species, there's one that reach higher density. But, but yeah, both species were uh, kept at low or lower uh, abundance because of avian predators during the summertime in the Arctic. So both species were facing the same predation. Yeah? Was it uh, paper research on uh, lemming, sorry, researchers in Greenland? And that they actually had four different, well, lemmings were fed on by the snowy owl, yep. weasel, and skuas. Skuas and Arctic fox. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The question was in Greenland. It was shown that uh, four predators, uh, long-tailed skua, Arctic fox, and weasel, and uh, snowy owls, were preying upon the lemming, and the weasel was the one responsible for those cyclic uh, oscillation in, in population. What we show here was only the, the avian predator part during the summertime. So how can they? How much impact do they have on that population dynamic? So we're not saying the, the avian predators are creating those cycles. We're saying they're keeping the cycle lower. They, they, they're kind of dampening those cycles. The weasel is present on, on our study site where we did that, the Arctic fox as well. So lemmings are facing a lot of predation over several uh, fronts. <clears throat> but the avian predator, predators are uh, dampening that, that peak in, in, in abundance in summertime. The weasel is pretty active in wintertime as well, causing those cyclic oscillation, we think. But uh, yeah, it's a scientist is still arguing about what's causing those cycles. But one thing that we know is that when you have those snowy owl and Jaegers at a, at a site, they're they're causing a lot of predation. Yeah. Do you see a lot of Jaegers at the area across the The question was if lemmings were cyclic over the whole uh, cycle. Yeah, well, uh, lemming population 
almost by definition are, are variating from one year to another. Some sites see more, um, the magnitude might be higher at some sites, but mostly we see the same kind of the same kind of level of magnitude for, for one a peak year compared to a, a low year, if we compare with Greenland or other sites. Uh, being that, uh, saying that, I mean, some site uh, doesn't agree with that. So there's a lot of discrepancy over the, the whole world, the circumpolar world. And the thing is, it's hard because there's not a lot of people living there. There's not a lot of uh, research areas. So we're limited by the number of places that we can go and, and measure them with the same technique. So for what we know, it's comparable, but it, there, there's some variation. But, and, and of course, if you have variation in that, you have variation in the number of predators as well. So. Yeah, sorry. The, the question was <laughs> if, if those living uh, population are synchronized across the tundra. And the, the, the answer is no. There's some synchronization uh, and a giving um, radius. And scientists agree about four or 500 kilometers to maybe 1,000 kilometers that if you have an eruption limbing, a peak in abundance, it's pretty much high in that region. And then as you move from that site, you lose that synchronicity. And then one year you have a, a high abundance in some region, eastern Canada, for example, and then at the same time you have a, a low abundance over the rest of Canada in the Arctic or Russia or, or in Finland and Norway. So sometimes it's, yeah, so there's syn synchronicity. Sorry about that. <laughs> Any other question? All right, so I'll, I'll run the, the stuff. Feel free to stop me whenever you want. Hopefully it's going to work on your uh, computers. And um, if you have any question, like I say, I'm, j I'm, I'm happy to answer any of that. <clears throat> so basically, you just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, a, like I said, I'm not a statistician. So I'm still going with a script in, in the text file and, and copy and pasting it. So um, I mean, I'm not fancy going with R, but it basically goes like that. You go with the, all the packages. Hopefully it will run. It, it ran with that computer uh, I tested two days ago. And then <clears throat> you, um, yeah, you can set the working direc directory, or you can, I'll, I'll set it later. So all that, that, that script, if you copied it on, on, from, the, from the drive, there's a hashtag and, and a little definition of what we're doing at each step. So it helps you to understand what, what's, what's going on. So, Basically, we're using Argos data, so we're using that projection, WGS84. Uh, it's not new for any one of you guys. <coughs> and then working directory. Uh. All right. So you import the database. You need, you need to use a format POSIX so it, so it works. And then, <clears throat> yep. What would you do now? That's okay. All right. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> It just it is just supposed to go like that. There you go. All right. <clears throat> and then you can just have a look. Structure the data. So I mean it imported well. I don't know if anyone's running it right away, but if you got that, that's a good sign. If not, I mean if you like I say, if you have any question, I'll I'll be happy to help. And then you're running all that thing to order the database with, uh, with the date. Um, <clears throat> so I provide you the data frame, the, all the data from the Snow Whale tracking we have done, so you can play around with it. We're going to use only one of the individual on one year to do the, <clears throat> the graph, 
But basically, and we're going to plot it. It's funny to see a, a plot. <clears throat> so those are the, the location from our Argos that we had. So you see there's a lot of noise, a lot of uh, data that are way out because they're lowest quality. And that you need a, there, there's a way to filter that either with a, I mean, I've worked in the past with the Douglas filter. It worked well. You can put all the parameters in. Uh, but the SSM will work with that, saying, well, that location, which is far out, <coughs> will get a, a, a lower value, a, a lower um, strength on, on the whole database, on the remaining uh, database. So, uh, but we'll still filter it with, with speed. But just so you know that we, we do have a way to filter that. <clears throat> so you can save that in a trip file. And then we're going to do it right after this. So here's, oh, I got the three years, but that's, that's even, even better. So you can plot that individual for three years. You see the, that guy spend a lot of time in the Arctic. I know because, uh, well, I see at the latitude, but that guy mostly stayed in the high Arctic during uh, all, those, all that time. And then finally, we're going to do that. So basically, you can, you can play around with it. What we did is to um, <coughs> get to a, a, a time, time step of one day. If you have more location and you want to go uh, more precise than that, half a day, uh, half an hour, I mean, you can just change it in, in that uh, formulation. So it was, uh, for our thing, it was, I mean, what we thought was acceptable, given the fact that we had a set location every other day, so we didn't want to push the envelope too much and going for more than one day. And for just the, the, the breeding dispersal, it was enough for us, what we were doing. But if you got a, a database that's, I mean, has a, a better time resolution and you want to go further with that, I mean, you can just change that. You can uh, change as well the number of time, number of iterations and, and how you thin the, the, the whole thing. But this is what we did. So I'm not going to run it because it takes about an hour on a computer. But I, I've saved the file and then we're going to use it. I think it should be ready just like that. Hopefully, yeah. <clears throat> and then what it what it looks like. Well, uh, and then we got we'll have those diagnostic graph looking at uh, the Markov chain and the resulting maps. <clears throat> and yeah, all those those things. But basically, you look at that second uh, column of, of graph. This is uh, just the, the the normal distribution of things. The other two graphs on the right side, I was helped with a statistician to do that, and he felt comfortable having those graphs. I don't, I don't know the details of those graphs, but if you have any questions, I might find out. I'll be happy to, to answer that. So if you use, I mean, then I can plot it, the, the result thing uh, map, and then you can save that data set into and work it as a new data set with one location per day and a behavioral state associated with it. So, oops, I hide that. So basically, it's you got that kind of that kind of path where each location has a behavioral state associated with it, and you can work and, and refine it. So what it looks like, basically, you have um, for each ID, each uh, transmitter that you have on, you have the day. Here's the data set for uh, one uh, time spent time step of one day, and then you got long, longitude, latitude. And you have that confidence interval to, to play with if you're uh, looking for that. And you have that uh, behavioral score or state in the, the, the 32 columns. So if it's two, it means the bird was moving, migrating. If it's one, it means the bird is uh, searching or uh, settling. So I think that's pretty much what I had. If you have any question, I'd be happy to answer that. And, other, and the rest of it is just how to plot that in, in, in R. So I can run it to look like I know what I'm doing, but this is basically it. 
And there you go. So you see that that bird was um, staying in moving state. This is the second graph, the, the graph in the middle. So the, the, the bird was in the moving state, the value closer to the top here, and then went to searching and then resume, or the opposite, so, sorry. He was searching in the wintertime probably and then start moving and then resume the, the, the searching position or state and settle to breed. So you have that kind of prob probability to assess if he's breeding or searching and moving and then you can refine it. What we've been uh, able to do with that uh, is that paper that we just got accepted uh, that we show where the, 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 the search area were and then uh, how much time was spent searching and, and moving. So if you want any details about that, I can send it to you. It's, it just got accepted, so uh, I have only the proof, but uh, I'll be happy to share. So that's about it. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's it's it goes with uh, sorry how it, it assess the, the the behavioral state that we that we use is looking at uh, the speed of travel and the, the turning angles from one location to the next. So if it it goes quickly and low turning angle, it's it's moving and the value goes closer to two, and then if it's the opposite, it's it's searching. So all those uh, equations are actually in the Johnson paper, and we just use it and and. To, to refine, I mean, to, to make it workable with a Snowy Owl database, but it's mostly uh, well described in that paper. Yeah, exactly. It was about seals in Arctic Canada. So they were showing, well, the Ar actual Argos location plus the estimation. And then, it, it, I mean, it was, and we did the same looking at our uh, location with Argos with the owls and then the estimation. And basically, it's a good reflection. But you do have a time step of one day that we didn't have, and we could assess behavioral state using those parameters. So it helps a lot with that study. So if it helps, of, if it's of help to anyone, well, I'll be happy about that. Yeah. With the uh, midnight sun as a perpetual start, is there, has anybody looked into when the birds are actually? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, being snowy out in the summer, I'll start with the summertime. It's 24-hour daylight, and but they're active throughout day, uh, day and night. So you can you can see them hunting by night or day. It's they just go and then they rest for the rest. So they do that. They can do as well in the in the in the, in the night when they went down here at southern latitude. Well, around here or, or Pennsylvania or New York State or. Well, they, they were more active at night, like, like we used to, to know about owls. So uh, they seem to be able to do both. When hunting about uh, lemmings in the Arctic, even if it's 24-hour daylight, and they're, I mean, all white bird in the tundra, they're pretty noticeable. But lemmings don't have a good vision, and they're, uh, they're not that quick. I mean, they're quick for me, but for an owl, they, I mean, they, they're still able to get them. So uh, we believe as, as if you had lemming, Active any time of day, the, the owls are going to be active as well. So, Does it, particular senses that they, how do they find the lemmings? When when they're settling in a breeding spot, when they're they're settled and they're breeding, they're mostly looking and using their vision. But one thing that we don't know the mechanism is when they settle to breed. When they get to the Arctic in in the spring, it's mostly 95 percent covered with snow, and they settle to breed. And they're, they're never wrong for, for what I've seen. I mean, when they settle at some point, when the snow melts, where there's a limbing peak happening. But I mean, it's under the snow when they settle. So I don't know how they, they, they figure that out. Probably the airing or an, anything else. But th there's a mechanism that we don't know what's happening. But they, they're, I mean, it's apparently pretty efficient. So we don't know how they do that, but they do. Good question. Uh, the question was, when they're coming in the south, what are they eating? And a uh, quick answer is that they, they go for both 
what they used to go for, small rodents in, in fields and that kind of thing. But we, one thing we discovered with that tracking is that those guys, well, the one from the, the, the Arctic, are going out on sea ice during the winter time. And then the one in the south, well, all the ones we trapped, we, we, we were pretty active this winter with Project Snowstorm uh, tracking a lot of owls. And many of them spend a lot of time on the, uh, the Atlantic coast or the Great Lakes. So they're going on the sea ice or on the lake ice or just on the, the edge of the water going for waterfowl, uh, gulls, uh, seabirds. So they can do both. They, they do have powerful talent so they can be kind of switched to and being opportunistic for that, for that matter. So. All right, thanks a lot.